Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are thrilled to be with all of you tonight, celebrating an evening of mystery. Um, we are here with Barbara Wilson and J.M. Redmond, two of Karis's longtime favorite mystery writers. Um, and we really were excited to do this event specifically in June for Pride Month, um, celebrating your long and pun intended storied history um, as lesbian mystery writers um, who our customers have just loved for decades now. Um, you've brought our customers so much joy, so much comfort, and I think particularly um, during the pandemic, you know, so many of our customers have really returned to some of their favorite series, some of their favorite authors. And so Barbara, you know, we're particularly here tonight to be celebrating your book, Not the Real Jupiter, um, which is a return um, to some folks that, that, you know, I think some readers maybe didn't think they would get to see again. So um, we're really, really excited to have you both here. And we're really honored to be joined um, in partnership by Sinister Wisdom. Sinister Wisdom is um, a, a community friend and literary friend uh, also of many decades. Um, and we're joined by board member uh, Roberta Arnold. And Roberta's gonna carry it away from here, but um, really quickly before she does, I wanna orient folks to this space. So I see that folks are already telling us where they're watching from. Thank you, please continue doing that. We love it if you wanna shout out your favorite um, titles, uh, your favorite characters from various books. That is always fun. And I wanna let you know that you can ask questions in the ask a question box in the bottom center of your screen. I'll pop up back up towards the end and facilitate the question and answer portion. So don't be shy. Um, please put as many questions in there as you like and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but mostly just make yourselves at home. Um, enjoy this Friday evening and um, welcome Roberta. Thank you for being here. Thank you, ER. I'm especially honored to work with Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural, multi-class, lesbian literary and arts journal publishing since 1976, a time when my mother, June Arnold, was published in its pages. The latest issue, number 120, Asian Lesbians, is 300 plus pages with contributors from around the world. Sinister Wisdom is now under the thoughtful watch of Julie R. Enzer. She brings the spirit of generosity and a keen poet sensibility to her stewardship, uncanny in its wisdom. We welcome submissions at sinisterwisdom.org, submit, and rely on your subscriptions and donations to keep publishing. Please help us continue to keep lesbian artistic achievement in print alive and thriving by supporting Sinister Wisdom and Karis Books. We're grateful to Karis for sponsoring this event and letting us be a part of it. My review of Not on Jupiter will be in the 2021 fall issue of Sinister Wisdom. The sardonic humor of the Barbara Wilson murder mysteries is sheer joy, as is the endearing character of lesbian translator sleuth, Cassandra Riley. In Not on Jupiter, Riley flies from Montevideo to Oregon for an author she is translating, and of course finds herself solving a murder. Fans of smart detective fiction, literary plot, and surprising worlds will love romping through Portland with Riley. The repartee inside her head is witty and clever, the pace quick and lively. Co-founder of Steel Press in 1976 and Women in Translation, her various books and skills are too many to mention here, so I refer, refer you to her website at barbarawilsonmysteries.com. It is an honor and privilege to welcome Barbara Wilson to this Karis event. I hope... Um, not, not on Jupiter can be purchased at karisbooksandmore.com. J.M. Redman has won over four Lambda Literary Awards for her books, featuring the irreverent butch P.I. Mickey Knight. Mickey's assiduous prowling around the streets of New Orleans will quench the appetite of anyone who's had a love affair with that city. Her latest mystery, Not Dead Enough, is a carefully interwo interwoven plot about a woman who comes looking for her missing sister with enough twists and turns to keep the veteran PI on and off her toes. Redmond is a captivating writer describing the lives of so many of us 
in such good humor that you will keep coming back for more, like getting together with a favorite friend. Karis Books can supply you with all the books in that scrumptious series. I'm happy and honored to welcome J.M. Redmond to this Karis Books event. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Karis is actually one of my favorite bookstores, and um, I sometimes my day job takes me to Atlanta or uh, on a regular basis, and I always try to make it a point to stop there. So I'm very happy to do this. I'm also very happy to do this because, um, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about my journey because it involves Barbara Wilson so much that um, and there was a time when there weren't as many books as there are today. There still aren't enough, but there could be more. But I wanted, I was reading some of the mysteries, um, Sarah Paretsky's, uh, Sue Grafton, Marsha Muller's and others. And I and, and I kept, you know, thinking, okay, I like this. I like the fact that that, and then I caught a book called Murder in the Collective. Um, that and probably uh, Catherine Forrest, uh, uh, Murder in um, uh, at the Nightwood Bar were the two that suddenly said lesbians can be the heroes, can be the detectives, can be the uh, people that decide what is justice and what is right. And so that was one of the things that told me maybe I could do it too. Maybe I could write a book. So I need to thank Barbara Wilson for the, the effect she's had on me personally uh, in, a, in a good way. Yes. Um, but also what she did and, and what she launched. Um, you know, we look back at it, and I think in some ways that, you know, that, that we started to tell the stories. I mean, there have been lesbian stories. You know, you go back to Sappho and stuff. There have been lesbian stories throughout history. But I think, and this is, of course, my just personal opinion, it's one of the most radical things we did was to take over the mystery genre and say we could be that too. Because if you look at science fiction, you know, yes, science fiction, you should have multiple genders and multiple sexualities. You know, let's face it, you know, 300 years in the future, we shouldn't be stuck in heteronormativity. Um, if you look at some of the others, the literary fiction, um, yes, you know, the, 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 you go back to Radcliffe Hall and stuff, and, and it can be terribly sad and stuff. But mysteries of the iconic uh, way that we say what is justice and what is fair and who is a hero and who has the power to decide that. And making a lesbian that character to say that we can claim this space this can be ours too. We deserve to be the heroes. We deserve to be the powerful people. Um, you know, even looking back on it, it recognized what a huge thing we did, and particularly the pioneers, Barbara especially, did that. Um, and so I want to thank you for that. We're going to go back and talk about that a little bit, but let's start in today right now. You just came back with a new book, um, uh, Not the Only Jupiter, which I absolutely loved. Um, I love all your books, um, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, I love the fact that she is a, a not fixed in space. She, she travels around. She's sort of that globe trotting. So what, what made you decide to come back to this book and come back to this character? Well, um, before I get started, I just want to give a shout out to Sinister Wisdom uh, I was an early subscriber, and I think you published one of my first stories. So really happy that they co-sponsored this this reading, and also to Karis Bookstores, also one of my favorite bookstores. My brother used to live in Roswell, so I would make it a point when I used to visit him and his family to to come by and buy a book. Of course, that's what it's for: buying books. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, J.M., you also are long-lived, and um, Mickey Knight, what a great character. I always loved her. Love her still, I mean. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so now that I've said all this, I've kind of forgotten what your question was, but I think you wanted to know how I sort of got started with mysteries. Um, is that right? Yeah, well, I was going to start kind of with, with the current book because we want to sell books um, because, you know, you deserve to sell a lot of books. Um, but what made you come back to this character? What made you decide you wanted to revisit her? Um, it's been a little while and, and brought you back in, into this world. Um, well, I had um, never forgotten about Cassandra, and I think she was always one of my favorite characters. She felt like a friend, compañera. Um, and I, over the years, I had done more and more translations. So I had also gotten really much more into the translation world. And I would think about her from time to time. I was occupied with a lot of other projects. But um, 
I um, found myself really needing a break from some of the more um, scholarly work I was doing. And I started thinking I would really love to revisit her um, and think about what she was doing now. And I had a number of ideas all of a sudden. This was a few years ago. And I had learned a lot in the meantime by reading mysteries and um, thinking about them, what I might do to still continue that character, but also continue that playfulness and the language use, um, the jokes. Um, and I was kind of curious to bring her back to the United States. She's an expat and she's lived in Europe and in South America and traveled a lot. So she doesn't come back to the States very often, sometimes for a conference, um, sometimes just in passing. She doesn't stay in touch with her family in Michigan. And I, I think because I was somewhat preoccupied as many of us were <clears throat> during the last four years or so with, um, <laughs> with this country, I felt like it would be kind of fascinating for me to set it here in the States and in Oregon, a state that I know really well because I live in Washington. So it was lots of different things. It was no one thing, but as soon as I started writing, I felt her voice come back to me and I so enjoyed her company. <clears throat> I really, um, I really realized how much I had missed her all these years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I guess let's, we can talk about a little bit more about uh, well, a lot more about mystery writing. Um, you wrote one of the first ones that really broke the doors open. Uh, if you can think back to that time, what was in your head? What made you say, "Hey, I can do this. I can, I can write this kind of book." Um, I was a big mystery writer, mystery reader too, and had also read a lot of those mysteries by men and also by women. And I think I thought to myself, where the hell is the lesbian? Um, and I had um, written a kind of action-packed novel, my first novel that was published by Spinsters Inc. in 82, I think. And it did have a little mystery element and it did have politics. Um, I was quite the lefty in those years and worked on an alternative newspaper as a journalist. And um, I think that I wanted to write about people I knew about collective life in Seattle. And a friend of mine sort of in passing mentioned a kerfuffle between an all lesbian collective and a sort of mixed collective. And they were thinking of merging. And I thought at first, oh, that would be really funny to write kind of a mystery <laughs> sound there. Yeah. Of course, it became much more than that. It became a look at, um, know, international intrigue with the Philippines, the Marcos regime, anti-Marcos activists. And I found myself um, having a way finally to make politics interesting. And so I had lots of fun with that. Um, and in the course of it, I kind of discovered what I, else I might do around uh, women's issues, feminist issues, lesbian issues in writing about the mystery. Okay, um, and you published three books so far. Well, yeah, she might come back. You never know. Um, characters <laughs> can come back. Um, let's talk a little bit about your journey as a writer, because uh, you have you have probably one of the most comprehensive and wide ranging writing careers of just about anybody I know. Uh, you go with, with uh, mysteries. Uh, certainly, the and the uh, Cassandra Riley mysteries are the witty, globe trotting. Um, yet bring serious issues. You've also done, you've done uh, Blue Windows, uh, your memoir, which uh, also won a Lambda Award, and it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I still remember some of the things in it, um, you know, and writing often doesn't affect me that way. Um, and of course, your translations and stuff. So let's just talk about your journey as a writer. You know, what made you start picking up the pen or the typewriter keys or whatever? And what's kept you going? And, and you know, what are the, the reasons and the, the, your, your twists and turns in your path? Well, um, I was dyslexic as a child. I didn't start reading until I was about seven. It was agony mm -hmm. in first yeah. grade. I was in the slow group. I couldn't mm -hmm. understand why but uh, none of the words made sense for quite a while. Wow. And then at some point in the second grade, I kind of got 
an idea about how I might read a little bit differently that suited me. And mm -hmm. as soon as that happened, I completely felt this overpowering sense of love for books. Uh, I wanted to go to the library all the time. I wanted mm -hmm. to write my own books. And I think by the time I was eight, I already had a sense of vocation. Um, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's ever left me. I've never wanted to do anything else. Um, my mother was somewhat encouraging. My dad just thought, well, yeah, but, you know, of course, you'll be yeah. a teacher. Maybe you could be a journalist. Um, but you should really learn to type. Uh, and I yeah. did learn to type. Good. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, one of my problems as a writer, aside from the fact that I needed to always continually learn how to write and write, is that there are so many things I didn't want to write about. I didn't want to write mm. about my childhood. I didn't yeah. know that about writing, about being a lesbian. I struggled with that for a long time in my yeah. 20s. Um, and it was only really by... Uh, trying and trying and also beginning to read um, journals uh, like Amazon Orderly and Sinister Wisdom. They were hugely important um, to see mm -hmm. the words of yeah. black women, other um, lesbians, but also feminists. Feminism and lesbianism were kind of linked in my mind right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I probably, I started out writing short stories like a lot of people, graduated to novels, got into mysteries and was really loved it. Um, it wasn't the only thing I wanted to do. And I did feel like I sort of got swept away by the excitement of it. Um, the books were popular in the 80s and they came out in England and were translated into different languages. I mean, you remember Argument Press in Germany. Yes. Um, yes, and, uh, there was a kind of craze for mysteries and that often opened up a mm -hmm. lot of opportunities to, um, to write more, to make money, to travel. Um, mm -hmm. But all the while I was aware that I didn't think I could keep it up. Um, you know, I was working all the time at the yeah. publishing company. I was interested in translations, uh, and I did want to write more serious books, too, and experiment with nonfiction. So, um, you know, after a while, I started trying to combine them, left Steel Press mm -hmm. in 94, so I could concentrate on my writing, and then really went mm -hmm. into nonfiction, to travel, travel logs um, set in the North Atlantic and uh, mm -hmm. in Lapland, did travel journalism, um, mm -hmm. and then slowly started doing more translation that led me into work on the indigenous Sami people in Scandinavia. So um, you can see I traveled very far away from my roots um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a lesbian mystery writer, though in some ways I guess you could say that, you know, I've always been interested in sleuthing. So whether it's memoir or detective novels or research, um, there's a way in which I've always been very curious and um, I mm -hmm. like to find answers. And so I think mysteries are great for that. I mean, you must think that too, if you've you know, been writing mysteries for what, 20, 30 years now, that there's, yeah. you, have that, you know, you go out and your character asks questions. She never takes no for an answer. You know, and in mm -hmm. Girl on the Edge of Summer, you also have her investigating in the archives and libraries in, in New Orleans. So I think that's a really important part of mysteries, don't you? Yeah, There's I do. And, um, you know, I think mysteries is a quest. I once had a college professor who said that um, the first mystery was actually Oedipus Rex. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Well, because something is happening to the Thebes, and I'm, I'm sorry, spoiler here, um, but something was happening bad to Thebes and Oedipus Rex as a king had to figure out what it was. And I was like, hey, dude, it's you. <laughs> you know, you you killed your father, you married your mother, and that's what brought the plague on to Thebes. So, uh, Thebes. so, you know, that was in some ways very much a mystery. You know, so it's clearly it's one of the, the uh, things that we want to know uh, cause and stuff. But, yeah, um, for a uh, girl on the edge of summer, my uh, wife is uh, – an academic and she is a um she does a lot of research in archives and stuff like that so she uh so i, I tapped into her expertise to do that because i really you know i, I think one of the things that, that we look at in life but also in mysteries is that the past is prologue 
and what was happening in the in the in that particular book, you know, in Storyville here in New Orleans was also, you know, had resonances in what's happening today, particularly the way women are treated. And so I wanted wanted to do that. But yes, it is it is a quest. And I think one of the fascinating things about your books, and particularly the Cassandra Riley books, is is the translator, is that that is what she does. She literally takes the words and and gives them new meaning and, and new life. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about your life as a translator, which I kind of find fascinating. You said, you know, who's going to want to care about that? But it really is kind of fascinating because to me, it's it's such a, you know, I, I think I have worked with translators. Obviously, I've had books, uh, The Argument, as you said, and I loved Elsa Loudon, the uh, editor there. Um, bless them for doing what they did. Um, but also, I've said in Spanish, I think I had one story that was put into Korean, which is really odd to see Korean now. You see your name and then all these symbols that you have no idea what they are. Um, but the idea of taking language and using language in ways that's so malleable and and yet at the same time, it's so imprecise. Because I remember them saying, well, how do we translate? You know, I was talking about live oak trees, you know, the big spreading oak trees with the Spanish moss. Well, how do you translate that into German? You know, if you don't have that plant or that, you know, animal or that sort of thing, how do you translate it? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how you pulled your experiences as a translator and what it means to you to be writing about a character who is a translator. Well, Cassandra is a serious translator. She's a professional, yes. so she's done that for many, many years, and she attempts to make a living from it. So a lot of what I'm writing about is also her relationships with publishers, mm -hmm. competition among translators, difficult authors, difficult agents, and, mm -hmm. and, and publishers and editors. So that's part of the satire of it. Yes. But in terms oh, of the work, I love the work itself. Yeah, the work itself that she does. I think, um, you know, one of the things about translation is that it, you, it can never be word by word. Um, no. Sometimes no. you're parsing it for meaning and you're thinking, what does this word mean? And you're looking in multiple mm -hmm. dictionaries for the roots of the word and the, all the possible meanings of the word. But you're also trying to get the feeling of the author across. And Cassandra is often trying to do that. You know, she's translating this book uh, called Baby's First Year by a Chilean writer. And she's working on this and she's afraid that the author is going to dump her uh, for another better known translator. But she's trying to figure out, was this written as a satire? of uh, a Chilean woman in Norway trying to deal with Norwegian healthcare? Or is this a very powerful story of an inability to bond with a baby? Um, mm, she's yes. got to figure that out. And in some ways, that um, is always her job in the mysteries. She's got to figure out what's beneath the surface and what does it mean when people lie to you when you're interviewing them or pretend to be someone that they're not. Um, she's sort of piecing it uh, together from small words and gestures and fragments. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, she's trying to look at the overall picture and see what the meaning of the whole thing could be, which is kind of what a detective does and what a detective mm -hmm. writer does too. Yeah. You've got it all in your head, um, but you're keeping bits and pieces away from the reader. Hopefully, you know, so they can think always, oh, I think it might be him. No, it's her. No, it's him. Um, until you finally reveal the villain at the end. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, one of the really good things about your books is it's less about who done it, but it's more about the journey because the journey is so enjoyable. Um, you know, that, that Cassandra is uh, a very intelligent woman and, and her perspective on the world. You know, I love the, the um, insight into, you know, the publishing world and translators and editors and all this sort of stuff. And we have uh, stories that we probably really shouldn't tell in, in public. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, the, it's, it's dealing with that sort of stuff and, uh, and the world that we... Uh, that you bring us into to talk about um, all those things, you know, the worlds that mysteries can bring us into, um, 
you know, I sometimes, and, and no, no comparison here, but when people look down at genres, I remind them that Hamlet is genre. And the things that you can do with these so-called genres to look at various things, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, how does uh, translation work? You know, what are the issues in, in the collective living and the, the frisions between the straight feminist and the lesbian feminist and, you know, the kind of uh, tensions that were on, particularly back in that time. Um, and you can take a mystery and really bring these things to the fore in a way that if you try to do it in so-called literary fiction, um, people might be, oh, God, I can't deal with that. Um, uh, but, you know, I because I, I guess I want to sort of continue to talk about this, but also to talk about, you know, for both of us, our, our journeys as writers to, to that moment, like you said, to come out and be a, a lesbian writer um, at a time when, uh, if we go back to it, you know, re reminding people that in most parts of this country in 19, well, my first book was in 1990, yours was in uh, 1984, um, the, the Murder in the Collective, is, you know, look at the laws in this country. They were, we were illegal people. And so what, how do you navigate being an illegal person but still going into a public space and saying that, you know, this is who I am. This is, I'm putting my name on this book. Um, you know, I remember that when my third book, uh, The Intersection of Law and Desire came out, that was the one that had been in that brief moment in the mid nineties when the uh, big, big publishers were saying, oh my God, LGBTQ or, or gay and lesbian anyway, that's going to be the next big thing. And so I was fortunate or uh, enough to be published by um, W.W. Norton. So it was like, you know, big deal and this sort of stuff. So the local paper, the Times Picayune, um, the book editor is very, uh, Susan Larson, who I absolutely adore. She's, she's been so supportive. Um, but so she put my picture and a big blurb, full color picture on the front of the living section of the Times Picayune. And this was back in the days when, you know, papers were actual papers. You go to the, you know, you go pick them up, you couldn't read them online and stuff like that. And I remember opening that picture, that, that thing going, Oh shit, these people, they know what I look like. They know, you know, where I am because here I am in full color, big, you know, half, half page picture of me, you know, with the book, uh, you know, lesbian everywhere. Um, and I, I was, I was sort of freaking out a little bit until um, a friend of mine said, Oh, don't worry. Those people don't read, um, <laughs> you know, but to me, it, it's, you know, and, and as, I think we talked about a little bit earlier, but you know that, that there's an era there that we, you particularly, me a little bit later, but you know, we were part of that era of creating that space, you know, book by book by book. And so I really kind of want to talk about, you know, the journeys that we had to go in there. Um, you know, what influenced you? What said, hey, write that lesbian book? You know, what else was going on? Um, that, that made you be able to go from being uncomfortable about being lesbian to being comfortable? And then what were the struggles along the way? Well, I think with Murder in the Collective and with that series, one of the things that intrigued me was the relationship between uh, lesbians and straight women and everyone mm -hmm. in between. I think that... Um, Sometimes when people look back, they think it was very rigid in those days. Mm -hmm. It was much more fluid than that. And yes. I do think that um, there was lots going on. Um, and I was kind of curious always about uh, if I could capture that. So with Murder in the Collective, I made Pam uh, a twin and her twin, Penny, is straight. So there was an entryway for straight people in that book. Um, and I think it w was taught in classes and people who were not gay read it. And mm -hmm. people would say to me, oh, this is really kind of the first time I understood um, how you could be a lesbian and not a straight woman because they're twins. And how is that possible? They love mm -hmm. the idea that they were twins. Mm -hmm. And I remember once yes. a woman in a class where I spoke said, yes, it made me feel like lesbians are almost human beings. I'm like, mm. almost? Oh, my God. I still have yeah. some work. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's a struggle, yeah. isn't it? I think that um, because I had been in uh, women's publishing for quite a while by that time, and mm -hmm. since... 
<clears throat> the late 70s. Um, my business partner, Rachel, my good friend, Rachel Da Silva, um, we had been publishing feminist work and we had been publishing lesbians for quite a while um, since probably the late uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were part of a network, the Women in Print Movement, uh, booksellers and newspapers and journals. And I think we already had a feeling for who the audience might be and that it was growing. So mm -hmm. I was writing for that audience. I knew that audience already existed. And when my books were published in England by the women's press, I also knew that's an audience. Um, and they mm -hmm. kind of toured me around in England, and it was very eye-opening to me. I remember I gave a reading in Aberdeen up in Scotland, mm -hmm. and um, these women were kind of agog, and one of them said to me, you know, you're the first lesbian writer I've ever met, and mm -hmm. I always wanted to write a lesbian novel, but I knew I would have to set it in Los Angeles because it could never <laughs> happen in, in Aberdeen. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so... Mm -hmm. I felt like I constantly got reinforcement um, for mm -hmm. what I was doing. So I didn't feel, I mean, obviously I met the same kind of homophobia um, mm -hmm. as every other gay person in one way or another, you know, not violence against me, but um, yeah. put, put downs and ignoring mm -hmm. and being left off lists. And, um, but, um, I think I just kind of accepted that. That's the way it yeah. is in those days. Um, I was very absorbed in actually the world that we were creating. Mm -hmm. There was a kind of utopian quality about that. And at the same time, there was a utopia. There was also a lot of hypocrisy. And so mm -hmm. for a mystery writer, that's a great thing, you know, that yes. we were going to be better as women. We were always going to be better. And lesbians were like the creme de la creme. We were going to be the best of all the women. But I could mm -hmm. see that was not true. That women yeah. were jealous, that they were angry, that mm -hmm. uh, they had unresolved family issues. And so I really jumped into that. I thought, oh, I can really, I'm interested in writing about women who mm -hmm. are struggling and women who are bad um, mm -hmm. and women who don't play by the rules. And I think what you were saying earlier about taking that space, walking into that space as a lesbian detective and detective writer is kind of claiming that power. Um, that mm -hmm. detective has the right, according to the rules of the mystery novel, to ask yes. questions. And people somehow feel like they've got to answer them. And mm -hmm. so as a result, they're a powerful, pivotal figure um, who are also struggling in their personal life. Um, and I could never write a wonderful, hard-boiled you know, detective like you do with Mickey Knight um, and, and and your other character. I I feel like, you know, for one thing, um, I'm easily frightened. So I would never want to put <laughs> you know, that character in uh, It's all you know, fictional. It's on the page. <laughs> Um, but I also never really could be bothered to learn everything about, you know, how police departments work. And mm -hmm. it was very convenient as a lesbian amateur sleuth, since I've created two, is that they don't really interact with the police that much. They're of that sort of old school, well, they kind of solve the murder because they mm -hmm. are, that's their world. It's the yeah. gay and lesbian yeah. world, or it's the feminist world, or it's a world that the police don't know anything about. Um, and the rules there are a little bit different. So mm -hmm. I escaped um, the whole needing to know how to shoot a gun and make a fast getaway and, you know, ID people. And uh, anyway, I, I've i kind of followed the British um, cozies in, in that way, in that mm -hmm. uh, the detective does a lot of, you know, physical gumshoeing, turning up at play, places, asking people questions, and also increasingly looking at their digital imprint, but doesn't take it to the final arrest and um, mm -hmm. doesn't ever have a shootout and uh, doesn't know anything about the law, really. Um, yeah. Just knows yeah. what's right. <laughs> well, now, I, I totally get that. I mean, I, I, I think I briefly considered police procedural, but then I thought, you know, I'm not going to walk into a police department, particularly um, in the South, and say, I'm writing a, a 
story about um, you know police and oh my main character is a lesbian or they would say hey can we read your books You'd be like no so I said <laughs> okay let me do a private eye well actually I really I like I say I had you know read mysteries uh, like you had read mysteries for a long time um, you know my 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 mother was very ill with cancer when I was in my twenties and one of the things we could do together still was I could read to her so we just read you know through oh just tons and tons of mysteries. Um, it, and but one of the ones I kept being drawn to were um, well, obviously the hard boiled, but particularly when uh, Marshall Muller, Sarah Grafton, uh, Sue Grafton, and Sarah Paretsky came out with you know it just really broke broke it open in so many ways. It was like wow, okay, if a woman can do that and claim again, it's that more step because if you've got you know you've got Miss Marple um, who's really more complicated than people give her credit for, <laughs> but you know when they said okay, we can do the things that so far only the men haven't been allowed to do. And I thought, you know, I really want to read that book with a lesbian protagonist. And there were, they've, there've been a number of uh, lesbian detectives. Um, and, but I kind of wanted, you know, I, I didn't get enough of them. It was like, you know, once every six months or so you might stumble on one. Um, and I thought, well, you know, maybe if you want that book, you should write that book. So I was really just kind of fooling around, but I thought, okay, well, what, what do I want to do? And then I was thinking about, okay, if she's going to be a private eye, what kind of woman would be a private eye? And that's why I said, well, probably she didn't come from a nice, happy household where everything was hunky dory. There are probably some issues that would have pushed her to be, to, to search for justice and, and to want, you know, that sort of truth and honor. And I want to be, uh, you know, work on my own. I don't want to work for anybody. Um, you know, what would make her that kind of person? And so that's the slow evolution of, of the Mickey Knight character. That's where, where she came from. Um, you know, and I like the fact that um, I, I can go to the greedy streets. You know, obviously I uh, live in New Orleans. I do now live in New Orleans. Interestingly enough, I wrote the first book when I was living in New York City. Because mm -hmm. after I, I, you know, I, I, you know, full confession, I grew up in a small town on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, I did not apply to college below the Mason-Dixon line because I knew I had to get out of that small Mississippi. I didn't quite know for sure then. Um, I came out as a lesbian in college. I was like, oh, that's why I never liked dating boys. <laughs> um, and then, you know, immediately I, I went to a college, you know, uh, just around New York City. And, and the day I graduated, I got in the train to New York City and I lived there for over a decade. But my father was a New Orleans native. My grand paternal grandfather was a bar pilot on the Mississippi, you know, one of the uh, tugboat captains that will meet the big ships at the, at the mouth of the Mississippi River because the river is so treacherous that you need a navigator, an experienced navigator to navigate. They don't let the, the regular captains, they take on a bar pilot to navigate around all the sandbars and stuff. You know, so we, I had always had a connection to New Orleans. It was always sort of the city of my imagination, the city that I grew up in as a child. And I think sometimes those those things that we encounter first and they're so new and fresh to us are the ones that that imprint on our, our brains. The way the, the light is in um, uh, early early October, November here, the way it changes. Um, it's just a, the, that it's a beautiful golden bluish light in a way that I haven't seen in other places. You know, I mean, small details. And so I felt like, you know, there are plenty of people who write about New York. No one's writing about New Orleans. No one's writing about the South. I am from there. I should be able to do it. So I just said, yeah, let me sit in New Orleans. And then I ended up coming down here and living here. I've been here for over 30 years now. Um, and know the streets pretty well that, you know, my third book, The Intersection of Law and Desire. Um, there really is a law street. There is a desire street. They actually do intersect. I actually got the title reading a small little blurb in the local paper that said, some person murdered somebody else and did it right in front of an off-duty cop who was arrested, and the incident took place at the intersection of law and desire. <laughs> and that's how I, how I came up with it. You know, so I think I think that's one of the really good things that came out of that movement is that you were writing the cozies, well, so-called cozies, uh, Catherine Forrest with the police procedurals, me over in the PI area, uh, Ellen Hart also doing cozy, although she's moved into having it uh, – her character as, as a, a PI as well. But the multiplicity of stories and the multiplicity of people, and what I like about your stories in particular you talked about is the complexity 
um, the tensions that in the, the early women's movement that we wanted this utopia and we felt like, oh my God, lesbians will be the perfect, perfect women. And then we turned out to actually really be human too. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of struggle with, you know, uh, the stories that we tell. And so I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, you do it so well, bringing in those levels of complexity. Certainly in this story, just the complexities of, you know, uh, Cassandra with, well, you know, her living situation is a little bit precarious. You know, she needs to make a living. She's a translator. And there's this stuff going on with other translators that may be taking over and now they had to publish. But you do so well, all this nuance and, and essentially making your characters human. And I think that's one of the struggles we have is as lesbians, as people of color, as all the marginalized people, is we need to be fully human and sometimes we aren't allowed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, and I one, think one, uh, one way that we, um, yeah. oh, somehow my voice is kind of coming back to me. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I think one way we do it in our books is, um, and mysteries are great at this because you have uh, your characters sort of going, uh, you know, detectives can traditionally sort of traverse society. They can go yeah. from the lower depths to the upper depths. They can go from the ghetto to the skyscraper. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, they have a lot of freedom that way. Um, and they often take the freedom or have it thrust upon them in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, um, uh, you have to, in some ways, when you're dealing with complexity, just act as if the detective has the right to know all this and to, mm -hmm. to move freely in society. And so I just assume that. Um, yeah. I assume that in all of my books that Cassandra uh, feels always free to do what she wants to. Mm -hmm. And she's not in a, ever in a relationship of any length. Yeah. She never has wanted to be and never will be. Mm -hmm. um, she prefers to have affairs with uh, women she's attracted to, especially in foreign countries, kind of love them and leave them. But she has yeah. tons of friends. So mm -hmm. she has a network um, and she has really close friends in particular in Barcelona and London. And I, so I gave her a community. I gave her many communities mm -hmm. and access to all of their secrets. Um, but I also gave her a kind of confidence um, that she doesn't have to explain herself to anyone. Yeah. She doesn't have to, um, you know, from time to time and not the real Jupiter, she says things like, it was no good being a lesbian translator in a small town in Oregon. But mm. it's not as if she's bothered by that. Um, right. She really wouldn't be entering the investigation, except that um, they seem to think she might be a possible su suspect herself yes. and so that they don't want her to leave the country they right, don't want yeah. her to leave Oregon even and she's stuck because she has to be back in London so that's what kind of motivates her um, that right. she feels that they're not doing their job they're not getting this done and she herself is going to have to uh, find out some answers and then kind of relay them to the police which she does um, with, uh, she's usually frustrated when she tries to do that. But I think that, um, I one way I think that we as queer people have learned to navigate the world is um, by just saying, this is how I am. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, once you come out and once you repeatedly come out and once you start mm -hmm. living openly, um, there's not too much they can say about that. And it's certainly gotten easier, um, yes. you know, you, if you say, well, my wife this or my wife mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. they kind of, you know, you see the little light bulb go off in their eye. Whereas before you had to make a decision, at what point do I say something? And right. at what point do I see them kind of invisibly recoil mm -hmm. um, or not invisibly, but take a step back. It is visible yes. to us. Um, and you just keep going. You just say, well, whatever. Um, right. And um, I think that's actually a huge superpower to have. It's a mm -hmm. real strength um, as a writer because eventually you just say, 
I don't know who I'm writing this for, if it's only a queer community, if it's only a lesbian community, or if it's for everyone. Because yeah. in the early days, people would, who knew me from some other, you know, maybe my job at the hospital where I worked mm -hmm. for a while, or maybe, um, you know, my neighbors, they would say, oh, I want to read one of your books. Mm -hmm. you have that. Yeah. And you just oh, think yes. to yourself, oh my God, because once they read it, they will know, yes, yes for sure, yes. lesbian, um, and they might not like it. And often I would get this kind of quizzical look. They'd say, oh, yeah, that's, I liked your book. Uh, that's not what I was expecting. Um, but uh, yeah. it was good. Thank you. It was Goodbye. really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yes. <laughs> right. At any rate, I think we can bring some of that social confidence to our writing. Um, and mm -hmm. I see that more and more. Um, with new writers, with younger writers. Um, it's uh, so much, it's still hard, um, but it's, you know, you're much more visible as a queer person than you were back in those days in the 70s and 80s for sure. Oh, yes, yes. And, and you know, and we weren't allowed that unadulterated joy of, oh, my God, I wrote a book, I sent it to a publisher, and the publishers, I'm sorry, I have a black cat that it wants attention right at the moment, <laughs> and, and just saying, oh, my God, you know, hey, guess what, everybody, I wrote a book, it's being published, you know, you had to go, oh, yeah. my God, I can't tell my family, or I can't tell, you know, my friends from high school, or I can't do that. And yeah. it's it's been a journey for me to get to the, oh, fuck it stage, or bleep it stage, oh. let's do it that way. Um, you know, I... Uh, I know there are times I'm like I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell these people that I got that book published. I'm not gonna do this. I can't do this. Um, and you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually had my 45th. Yeah, I'm that old. Uh, high school reunion um, at the uh, Sacred Heart Girls High School in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, they they hunted me down. They saw so, you know the Facebook will stalk whatever. We're trying to find all the classmates. Yada yada yada. And I was like, okay. Be careful what you ask for. So I was like, I, yeah, um, I'm going and I'm going to bring my wife. And I have to say that there were a couple of them. I could see the, oh, uh-uh, get behind me, Satan. But most of them were actually pretty good about it. You know, I was like, hey, this is my book. A couple of them, um, you know, were really very cool. But it, to get to that point, okay, 45 years uh, from the day I graduated high school to this reunion to be able to get to that point. And for, I think for a lot of us, that really was that journey. And as you talk about the moments when we we struggled, um, you know, I remember um, when I was doing my third book. Oh, here's the black cat. You must see the black cat. Yes, this is Mr. <laughs> Squeaky. Hi, Mr. Squeaky. Yes, he loves attention. Um, he is, if you ever come visit, he will be your best friend within two seconds because he's that kind of cat. Uh, but anyway, you know, um, when I was, you know, when my third book, um, the, the book that I actually had an agent and, you know, was going to be the next big lesbian, uh, private eye, yada, 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 following um, Sarah Paretsky and that sort of stuff. And um, she was taking it out. And I had an editor, one uh, publisher that I will not name, who was like, I really love this book. I want to do it. I want to do what they call an overnight exclusive, um, which is that the, the basically it was like, don't send this out to other publishers. We really want it. And so, of course, it turned into a week and then two weeks. And then my agent called me back and she said that he's the editor of that house said it had gone all the way up the chain. And the person at the top had said, well, we you know we're, we're about to be sold and we don't think we'll be sold as easily if we have that kind of book on our list. Hmm. You know, so that's what we, you know, faced in our careers, the things that for a lot of writers that I think you, and I'd like to think me because I've got that kind of ego, but who knows? But I think you should have been way more successful. I think a lot of the uh, writers, the lesbian, the gay male writers, we should be more successful and we aren't because of that. I, and my theory is particularly back when you and I were coming out that, uh, and the books were out and that sort of stuff, straight women particularly wouldn't be seen with a lesbian book. You know, and I understand why. I get it. The, the, the huge social stigma is, you know, you're not feminine enough when the, which is, or you're not, a, are you a dyke or something like that? And that women had to stay away from it. But 
it's a hard thing to look back and realize, you know, maybe I would have been able to quit my day job and work full, you know, and write full time, or maybe it wouldn't have been that big a struggle or looking at other people and knowing that you're, that they're successful. Um, so I just, you know, one of the things I kind of, it, it's not that I want to bemoan it and say, well, it was us. Cause I don't think, I think we're wildly successful. Um, and, but I, I, for kind of for the audience to see the, the, the life that, lesbian writers the things that we had to deal with to keep going and i think that's one of the things that i kind of also want to want to bring out here is you're still writing you know you've been writing for decades and decades now and you're still writing and you're still doing it so what keeps you going despite you know some of those things and if you want to talk about some of the obstacles you faced and gone over um you know to get here but what keeps you going Oh, uh, well, I always think back to um, my early school years and um, mm -hmm. the teacher would often write things to my mom saying, Barbara only works at the things that she wants to do. She doesn't like mm -hmm. to do what the rest of the class is doing. Yeah. But she works really hard at the things that she wants to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always been true of me that yeah. I... Um, exist in a world where my cre creativity is such a joy to me and I can't believe that every day I wake up and I get to write mm -hmm. and I've made it the focus of my life I mean yeah. I've had to do many other things mostly right. in the literary professions mm -hmm. of one sort or another to survive but I um I do write and I always have and I think it feeds me so much mm -hmm. um, spiritually uh, to be able to do that. And I think that, um, you know, we did have a difficult time and I think lesbian writers always had a difficult time. And I think part of the reason is that we were also often feminists, not everyone, mm -hmm. but um, not only did we write about lesbians, we wrote about a certain kind of lesbian who also um, thought she was good enough um, yeah. a lesbian who um, wanted to change the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that that as much as sexual preference was actually a real sticking point. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think it was, it was dispiriting and it was corrosive to many people. And I do think that a lot of people stopped writing during those mm -hmm. years, you know, they published yeah. one or two books with feminist presses mm -hmm. and then were, tried um, to either break the boundary and move to the mainstream mm -hmm. or um, didn't um, or yeah. had one or published by the mainstream and that was it um, mm -hmm. you know sort of a self they were always saying oh lesbian books don't sell um, mm -hmm. and then you know they would make sure that they didn't sell yes, in a way exactly that would yeah stop fulfilling <laughs> fulfill the prophecy but I think that um, I couldn't live in that place I couldn't mm -hmm. um, always be thinking, oh, if only, if only, or it's, oh, you know, yeah. you just end up a sore head. And, you know, there are some lesbian writers who are sore heads and they mm -hmm. make a meal of it every time you talk to them about it. And I don't think we want that either. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, one of the things that was really interesting for me when I published my memoir with Picador is that the level of attention was really different. And I say yes. in the memoir that I'm a lesbian, but it is mostly mm -hmm. about my childhood and about yeah. my mother's uh, illness and, and mm -hmm. death at Christian Science Church. And I was reviewed in The New Yorker. I was reviewed here. I was reviewed there. You know, yeah. I uh, suddenly had a really different profile. And I was curious after that because I so often heard, oh, lesbians can't write. And I thought, well, to hell with that. Yeah. I think see um, uh, what I can do if I write essays. Um, and the next thing I knew, I had essays in many literary journals, um, mm -hmm. American Scholar, Harvard Review, um, yeah. New York Times. Um, and I thought, well, yeah, as long as you don't write directly about being a lesbian, you can still be a lesbian. Um, right. How interesting. Um, and yeah. of course, that was something that many people had figured out way before me, um, that uh, it's the content, not the mm -hmm. personal sexual preference. But that wasn't what I wanted either. Um, and I think that um, I feel like I've been really fed by my queer 
life. And I think that it influences everything I write. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in women's history. I'm interested in outsiderness. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in uh, kind of cultural resilience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, many of the things that I read about, write about and study have to do with um, people who come through on yes. a personal level or on society. And I feel kind of incredibly blessed Mm -hmm. You have lived through this whole period because, as you know, it was not uh, foreordained that we would be in this particular place now. I mean, right. I just thought, wow, well, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, for one yes. thing, we didn't all want to get married back then. We right, wanted no. something else. We didn't know that mm -hmm. would become the defining um, feature of our lives. Right. And I think that um, I don't know what I thought. Um, I just thought that it was always going to be the same, um, that we would always be excluded and outsiders. And there was a power in that and there was a joy mm -hmm. in that, yes. but um, that we would not make any political progress. And I was really wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, things have changed unbelievably since uh, the yes. 70s. And I've seen how activism uh, can work and mm -hmm. I, feel that it gives me an optimism about many different uh, liberation movements and anti-racist movements and mm -hmm. um, that you do need to hang in there. You do need yes. to um, never give up. And I think by being queer, um, that gives you a perspective on how that happens. I mean, it's possible that it might not have happened in my lifetime, um, but it did happen in my lifetime. And I feel really profoundly grateful to have seen that. So, yes. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, particularly uh, uh, to, uh, when I started writing mysteries, I felt like, well, of course, queer writers, um, that because a uh, mysteries and particularly, like, particularly the, the private eye, but I think across the board, mystery writers are the out, the, the protagonist is often the outsider. Um, and for the private eye, the lone outsider, the person who is, you know, kind of on the edges of society and looks out. And, and what better uh, perspective than being, you know, queer, that you are, you grow up in what you, in a quote, normal family, you know, you're a member of that society, and then you find out you don't really belong to it. And you have to question a lot about that society, the things it tells you, you know, that you, you grow up, this is what girls are, and this is what boys are, and you get married, and you question some of the most fundamental things in society to find out, you know, who you really are to, to get, seek that self. And to me, that's like, well, yeah, of course, that would be the perfect detective. You know, the person mm -hmm. who has gone through that process, who has been able to look at their own life, at some of the things that have been basic to their own life, the way they're brought up, and can, can look at that background and say, let me, let me ask some questions here that I don't think this is quite right. I think there's some things that you're making assumptions about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a lot deeper and, and find this in, in myself. And then to take that as the outsider, the person that knows that, you know, um, if they knew who I really was, they might reject me. Or I'm going into a dangerous territory, not because it's intrinsically dangerous, but it's dangerous for me. Um, and and to, to live that, that kind of life. So for to me... Um, I, I think, you know, you're right, the queerness across the board, the way, you know, as, as lesbians, as gay men, as transgender, we write about, you know, our lives, it creates, you know, again, it creates that space. But being the outsider for me works very, very well in, in the mystery. And, you know, I, I do think that, you know, we talk about change and there, there are small incremental steps. You know, every once in a while we give a, a few people get a chance to really bend history, but most of us, it's the day to day. I kind of try and tell some of the younger folks that things do change, but we're like water wearing away stone. And when you do the one drop of water, it seems like it's impossible. It seems like it's still this huge boulder, you know, in your way. But over time with the struggle, eventually, you know, that water created the Grand Canyon. You know, we have to be those drops of water and we can do that, you know, in multiple different ways. And one of them I think is books. Um, you probably had the same experience, I'm sure you have, is I've had people that write me from all sorts of places saying, I read your book, it was the first one, or I, I really felt like I'm not alone, or this book spoke to me, it gave me courage, it helped me through my life in ways that I think 
you know, the, 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 the upside to what we do is you, we can have that profound an effect on people who really need that. I think in a way that writers who aren't as outcast as we can be, just they, they can't do that because there's, there's not that kind of danger in their world. Yes, those are all really good points. Um, I think the detective as outsider and the detective who's used to a certain kind of danger already just by mm -hmm. virtue of being queer, um, I, I, I think there's something to that. And I think that's, um, you know, that may be why people write you, write us, uh, to say this book was important to me because it transfers a kind of mm -hmm. um, questioning attitude or a certain confidence or strength. Um, I mean, one of the things I'd like to ask you is whether you get uh, people writing or, or telling you uh, they'd rather, they'd like a more positive character, like Mickey, does she really have to drink so much? Or uh, Mickey, oh, yeah. you know, is she lonely? You know, we'd like to, you know, because I remember there was always a lot of pressure from the get-go uh, that we should have happy stories, you know, yeah. the whole coming out novel always ended very happily. You know, right. I met this woman, oh my God, I'm a lesbian. Now I'm really happy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes in the early days, people would say, phew, your books are so refreshing because the women are terrible um, and people <laughs> don't get together and they're unhappy and that's like my life. Um, yeah. But I didn't wonder if, you know, you got that sort of feedback from anyone, um, like, can't Mickey, you know, have a happily ever after marriage with somebody now? Yeah. Oh, no, everyone universally loved Mickey. No, not. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was interesting, to, you know, it, actually the German translation, because uh, I, I was lucky enough to travel to Germany, and I traveled with Elsa, who was the uh, publisher, as my translator, which was just a great time. Because um, everywhere we went, she was like, oh, we're going to get wine and we're going to get cheese and this sort of stuff. And we're going to eat the cheese of this area and the wine of this area, this sort of stuff. So it was great. Um, after we did the readings and anything, just, just in case you're wondering. But it was, um, <laughs> she said that they, they had a number of readers in, in for the first book. And there was a huge argument about, you know, she's too much of an asshole, she's too messed up, she's too this sort of stuff, whether or not to, to publish it. And I think they that, that uh, Elsa being who she was, like, oh, that I want to publish that. Um, but I have had had people that that are like, well, why, you know, exactly, why can't she be, why can't she be happily ever after? You know, I've had people that I think are reading me as a romance writer, and I'm not. And I have to tell them that, you know, and I, I, I like romances. Let me just, you know, my little trope is that I think genre speaks to things that we really need. Um, science fiction, you know, the future, what do we need in the future? Um, romances, you, you know, one of the big struggles of life is finding connection, finding love. It's a really important thing. Mysteries for justice and stuff. So I, I think they're all equal. My interest is justice. It's not so much the romance and finding the connection and love. It's how do we search for justice? How do we find that? So I go into the mysteries. And so when people read it, I've gotten a lot of, why can't she be happy? You know, why is she in, in this messed up relationships and, and this sort of stuff? And, you know, and, and my, of course, you know, my feeling is if, if she's ever fat and happy, that's when I stop writing about her. That's when she stops being an interesting character. So be careful what you ask for, because, you know, when, when she finds, you know, her true love or happy, whatever, then that's it. That's sort of uh, where, where she goes. So it's, I've been writing about her and, you know, I never had a plan. You know, you, you plan out a couple books in advance, but I never thought I would be this far. I never thought I'd be this interested in this character, but certainly um, I am. And I think one of the things is what I am interested in is how do very flawed, messed up, ambivalent people still search for justice and to do the right thing? How do we, how do we continue that search or that ask the questions or do that, even if we're messed up and we're, you know, we want to go home and put our feet up instead of going out and, you know, asking a few more questions or we're tired or we need to make some money. But how do people make those decisions? And I think it's, it's very small steps to between doing how do you do the right thing and then how do you do the easy and then not 
so and then wrong thing and i think vi villains are often villains in shades that they fall into villainy by by a little bit of rationalization and a little bit of rationalization and a little bit of convenience and so that that's been my interest a, a, as a writer and probably like you have had to say okay you know i'm never going to be a bestseller so i'm going to write what i want want uh, about the the topics that interest me and people who are conflicted and not perfect interest me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great answer um, because I do think that um, that's one thing that people love about mysteries and your mysteries is the fact that, um, you know, the character is ambivalent and messed up in some ways. Um, it just makes her more complex and intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, and the mystery genre is perfect for that, yeah. 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 I well, think, about, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I think you can also write uh, characters and mysteries who are um, obviously flawed, but they don't, um, you know, I think about Cassandra a little bit. I think about mm -hmm. some of the models that I've, I've sort of wanted to subvert mm -hmm. um, that her problems are, um, you know, kind of common problems in some ways, um, mm -hmm. financial insecurity as a freelancer, mm -hmm. um, uh, uncertainty about what older age looks like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uncertainty about where she should be living, what she should be doing, right. how long she can continue to work. Um, I think you know, she's less concerned about um, trying to find a mate than to have a strong enough network of friends mm -hmm. who somehow or other will be there for her when when she's when she needs help. But she's not knowing when that will be at all. Right. So I think some of the conflicts that she's facing are not necessarily with demons from her past or mm -hmm. um, her you know flaws. They're also about being an older woman, a single older woman of any preference in the society that we live mm -hmm. in. Yeah. So, and I really noticed that a lot when I was writing Not the Real Jupiter because I had decided that I was going to bring her up in age, mm -hmm. that I was not going to pretend she was still 40. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first started writing about her, she, I think she was around six years older than I was. And then she kind of stayed in her 40s <laughs> for quite a while. And yeah. that's a very common age for uh, detectives, um, yeah. 30s and 40s. They just stay there forever, basically. And technology comes and technology expands and, mm -hmm. you know, memories that they might have had of typewriting kind of vanish. Um, yeah. So they're kind of always losing their past in a way. Mm -hmm. Whereas I thought if I bring her up to late sixties, I think she can still physically do what I need her to do. Right. Um, but she is more preoccupied now that people she knows are retiring all mm -hmm. around her with, am I going to be able to do that? Do I want to be able to do it? No. And so there's a woman uh, who befriends Cassandra uh, named uh, uh, Nora. Um, mm -hmm. And she's a writer and she's even older. She's in yes. her mid seventies or, or older. And I think that I wanted a woman like that to sort of prove to Cassandra that she too could enter right. her seventies and um, still be active and still be writing and still mm -hmm. be pursuing cases. So I found myself just dealing with a lot of a lot of things that um, I worry some about, but I think that a lot of um, women who are getting older worried about mm -hmm. as well is that yes. financial financial aspect of life. Anyway, well, I think so, the, yeah. what's what you did really well is is you know sometimes you have to have murder mystery you know uh, things where it's the world's gonna blow up. Um, you know, but no, but it's so big and so, you know, you can't really relate to it, but you relate it so well. She's so real that even things like, well, is she going to lose this translation becomes, oh my God, this is important because it's important to her. And I care about her because you made her such a real person. And yes, and I, I guilty, guilty, guilty. I have kept Mickey in sort of a, you know, we started out, I was, I think a little bit older when I started writing the books and now I'm 
a lot older um, because I need to keep her as a physical detective. And it's like, okay, well, what, you know, how do you have a, write a detective where she's having knee replacement surgery and she has to run after the bad guys? <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, I don't quite want to want to go there. Um, but yeah, it, it is kind of a problem. But I think you've done it so well to talk about. And, you know, the way that, that Cassandra's choice is that, that she lives this, life where she's, you know, she's got a place in London, she hangs out in Barcelona, you know, um, uh, she's been in, you know, she's been all over these, these fantastic places in the world, but it also leaves her with some uh, disconnects in terms of the kind of longevity you have if you stay in the same place in the networks. And it's a really fascinating sort of way to look at, you know, through the lens of, well, as we're aging, you know, it could happen to all of us. Even if you have friends, well, what happens if they die off before you do? You know, so I, I think it's it's one of the brilliant things that you do in the mystery is it's not just about solving the mystery, but it's about these people and their lives and how do they live their lives and the choices they make. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's one of the things that's really important in the mysteries that I keep coming back to are the are the how do we make people really people in a way that, you know, we deal with. And sometimes it's the politics, like you said, the, that, you know, the, the collectives, the uh the dealing with, um, you know, uh, the things that are going on, um, you know, with, with the Mickey Knight books, um, you know, I particularly dealing with the aftermath of Katrina and what that was like here in New Orleans and the things that weren't no longer on the cameras, the way that we try and bring in real life to the mysteries. Uh, do you have any secrets for that, that you're caring to divulge to the, uh, the writers and the audience? <laughs> Well, you have some choices. Are you going to make the character uh, like you in a way yeah. um, so that you automatically understand some of those things um, and can write aspects of your life into it? Are you going to make your character like someone you know? Mm -hmm. Are you going to make the character completely different? And um, I do think that usually we want to mix uh, of that. Um, mm -hmm. We want to have the character enough like us sort of maybe politically um, yeah. and uh, emotionally in some ways so that we recognize that. And I would say that one of the ways that I connect with um, uh, Cassandra is financial insecurity. I mean, mm -hmm. I've given her a different childhood. Um, yeah. I sort of, you know, my grandfather was born in Ireland and mm -hmm. uh, my mom grew up in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. And so I I decided, okay, she's from Michigan and she's Irish, American. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, she was uh, somewhat, I don't, I've never really decided what her dad did, but um, I think she's- <laughs> Next book. <laughs> she's never wanted to collect things. She's always traveled. She's, mm -hmm. um, she's financially kind of always on her own. And yeah. I think that's how I have always felt um, mm -hmm. that um, I, you know, because we had a lot, my mother was so ill, we had tremendous health uh, bills mm -hmm. from the time yes. that I was 10. And my dad never really recuperated from that. So there never was any money. And yeah. um, I always had the feeling like something could always happen. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't, me from becoming a writer, which is about the most financially insecure thing right. you can ever do. But it always makes me kind of worried. Um, like, can yeah. I keep this up? And yes. I'm married, you know, and I, my mm -hmm. wife has a government job, but I still feel um, quite yes. nervous sometimes. And Cassandra has this, so I mm -hmm. can, it's easy for me to give that to her. But in other ways, um, you know, she's very comfortable being an expat. And I tried it a couple of times. I wanted to live in England with my lover at the time, but I just mm -hmm. missed Seattle too much and mm -hmm. sort of unfortunately realized I was American enough um, to yeah. actually miss this. Country. I didn't yes. want to spend the rest of my life um, with English people. I didn't really understand them, in fact. <laughs> but I go to London yes. a lot, and I have a lot mm -hmm. of friends there. So I know people who have spent their lives there, Americans who are ex ex yeah. So I kind of understand that, too, via my right. friends. Yeah. Yes. 
you know, and then there are people in my books that I don't know where they come from, you know, a chance acquaintance or mm -hmm. uh, someone I might have known briefly in the past, or I think, well, she's a Spanish translator, of course, she's got to know Latinas. And so yes. what kind of Latina women characters would I like to have in this book in right. particular? Um, mm -hmm. So there's always that, um, always those choices and always that mix um, when you're writing of the familiar and mm -hmm. the completely imaginary and yes. everything in between. Yes, ag ag agreed. Sometimes, you know, I pull little bits of my life and it's like, oh, yeah. you're writing, but it's like, no, 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 I just needed somebody who lived in a small town. So I looked at the small town I lived in and I took, took that because I just needed, you know, a little bit of that. Um, I know we are coming up to, I think it's, uh, we have maybe another 10, 15 minutes by my watch. I wanted to see, you know, I, I would love to keep talking, but I felt like I, it'd fully be fair to give, um, see if there are any questions out there from the audience. I'll be glad to keep, keep asking them. Hi, E R. Hi, E R. <laughs> Do we Hi. have any questions? Yeah, there are some questions. So um, the first very practical question was um, Catherine McKenzie asked if Barbara's other books in the series are in print, and they are. Um, they're available through mm -hmm. Keras in ebook form. So we partner with Kobo, um, which is an ebook service. So you can buy them through our website, um, through Kobo, but you can also buy them um, direct from Barbara's website in print. So. Um, Barbara Wilson mysteries.com, which is in the, the notes. You can, you can buy them there. Yes. No, that's not true anymore. Okay. No, uh, I do have some copies of the print books, but it's mostly as eBooks, open okay. road media, publish them. And then they're widely dispersed, but I'd love to see them in print sometime, but I don't know if that will happen. Okay. So that's good to know. So, um, yeah. so yes, yeah, we are, so we are, we are both distributing them as eBooks. Um, <laughs> so, um, but we're very glad that they are all in print and you can read all of them in the series. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question is, um, and you, you, you all sort of address this um, in actually in your last comment, but if you want to elaborate, how does a writer write across cultural differences um, or write about a race or ethnicity that is not their own? Well, uh, I've made many attempts over the years in one way or another. And um, I think, um, especially when it's a different race, um, it helps if you have friends of, of that race. And I, I think um, I've had uh, friends who are black. I've had I've asked friends who are black to read um, my books, uh, especially in the early days in Murder in the Collective and all those Pam Nielsen books. There's a character named June who's in the Collective, and my friend Evelyn White read those and kind of gave me feedback on that. So that's that's one way. Um, you know, these days I I think a lot about what I say about people who are different from me. Mm -hmm. um, and I um, am cautious and careful, but I, I do want to include them in the writing. And so mm -hmm. in Not the Real Jupiter, I have several characters who are Latinas um, from different backgrounds. And uh, my partner for eight years, uh, 20 years ago was Costa Rican. So I've got some idea of the culture with her family. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I have friends who are Latina and I, I, I want them in a mystery, they have to be mysterious and they have to mm -hmm. be suspicious. And so that's kind of tricky sometimes, I think, um, mm -hmm. because uh, if they're going to be a suspicious character, then they have to sometimes act um, in suspicious ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to cross boundaries by then sort of anyone generalizing and saying, oh, all, um, all, all women from this background are, are like this. And so I try and also bring in some class issues, you know, make sure to 
talk about the fact that people come from very different countries, South America, Central America, Mexico. So that's interesting for me. And I don't know if I fully succeeded, but I have done my best. How about you, JM? Um, I would say imagination, uh, research, you know, huge amounts of research, including talking to people, um, and also being able to take the risk because of the choice we have is we either confine ourselves to our background and we exclude people who should be living in the worlds we create or else we take the risk to make sure we create them and the, the risk that we might be, be wrong about it. And that's a hard thing to do, but I think it's really being open and listening and making sure you, um, the, you know, today there, there are things that they call um, uh, cultural editors and uh, we're recognizing that they're as important as a copy editor, as a sort of editor. But if you're, if you, you, you should uh, honor someone's knowledge and background and understanding of cultural issues. And sometimes, if you need that, you know, get a cultural editor, get someone who understands that community. Um, you pay them what you can afford. Um, you know, buy them a really good dinner or something that 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 values their time and their expertise, and ask them to read your book as well. So, I mean. You know, again, take 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 the risk. Take you know, learn learn about the communities and be as culturally open and as culturally humble as you can be. Yes, definitely. I was going to suggest um, they're sometimes called sensitivity readers as well. Yeah. So um, that you may, when you when you Google search people in your area, you may try both terms. Um, so um, Catherine asks, right now it seems like young adult. LGBTQ plus characters and books are everywhere, yet adult lesbian fiction does not seem to be published at the same rate. I started reading lesbian books in the late 80s, early 90s, and it feels like there were more books being published then. Do you see a resurgence happening with small presses, or has the publishing industry consolidated too much? Do you want to take that first? <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, I, I think actually there are a lot more lesbian uh, uh, books being published. Admittedly, they're the smaller presses. Um, I know the two biggest ones are uh, Bella Books and Bold Strokes Books, and there's some others that are around. Um, they do focus largely on the on what the quote unquote more genre fictions, uh, some romance and science fiction, uh, some mysteries and stuff like that. But they publish, I believe, between the two of them. Uh, probably about 20 titles every every month. I'm I'm currently published by Bold Strokes Books. You know, um, uh, you, the Bywater Books, Bell Books, uh, Bold Strokes Books. Um, you know, catalog. That's why they're all in the top of the alphabet. Um, but there are uh, yeah, there's a huge number of them. Sometimes they are hard to find. They don't always get the kind of recognition that they do. I think you know, even today, the lesbian books still tend to be a bit more marginalized than some of the others. Um, but but they are, I, I do think they are out there that compared to uh, what there was in the uh, late 90s and uh, late 80s and early 90s. There are more, but they're not always as easy to find. I think one of the things we have lost is the network of um, women's and feminist bookstores. Uh, Karis is one of those who has really made, find out a, a way to, to survive. Uh, I think Women and Children uh, First in Chicago is still going on, but there are so many others that, that aren't around. And those gave us easier access. And so now you have to find out, you know, who's a publisher, where can you find it? Um, and it makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I think um, I would agree that there are more books, lesbian books being published now than there were uh, in the 90s. But I think what happened and what we lost is that lesbian writers at the beginning of their careers, then when they were in their 30s, sometimes 40s, mm -hmm. never were able to build an entire career. Um, yeah. And I think that um, very few somehow managed to do that. And uh, it's, you know, so a number of writers would have liked to have done that. And I sometimes <laughs> think about some of the writers that I published at Seal Press, who I was very proud of, you know, one, one or two books, Terry de la Pena, um, Becky Bertha. Um, I think both of them had careers in them of lesbian writers. And 
it was not to be. They, you know, yeah. Seal Press after I left stopped publishing fiction and concentrated on nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, people struggled. Mm -hmm. They didn't. There, the presses just started to disappear. The bookstores mm -hmm. started to disappear. Um, it was sort of a bleak period for a while. And some of those authors still are, are publishing. You know, they've had multiple publishers, like Lucy Jane Bledsoe is a really fine writer. Um, she's mm -hmm. gone on and developed yes. as a writer. But compared to, say, British lesbian writers like Sarah Waters and Jeanette Winterson and Ali Smith, uh, Val McDermott, for example, um, they had real careers. Um, they became writers and they became part of the literary establishment and they had venues for their work. Um, that didn't happen in this country. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I dropped the up-to-date list of feminist bookstores around the world that Karis curates. And mm -hmm. we try really hard to, to elicit feedback about it from new bookstore owners. And um, so we would love for folks as you're traveling, hopefully you get to travel in 2021 mm -hmm. uh, yes. safely, um, go visit these stores and support these stores because one of the beautiful things that's happened, particularly in the last five years is this downward trend of feminist bookstores closing and disappearing mm -hmm. um, is starting to reverse. And so yeah. we now have more bookstores opening and some of them are in a different, they, they practice their, their feminism slightly differently than Karis does or, or mm -hmm. Room of One's Own or um, Women and Children First. But, you know, we really feel like that's an exciting thing um, that there's this, this growth um, mm -hmm. and, and the sort of heterogeneity of how they are approaching what it means to be a feminist bookstore. So I hope folks will be excited about that and, and find their way to some of these other stores. And I will say, um, you can always find your Bold Strokes, Bywater, and Bella Books at Karis. We will always carry them. They will always mm -hmm. have um, their dedicated shelf because um, <laughs> there are many young, one thing I will say is there are many young um, lesbians who are coming out today who don't don't know, right? That that, yeah. that they could come in and immediately find lesbian books on, on that shelf mm -hmm. right there. So um, it is important, I think, to to make sure that people do know this is, these are the presses that have always had those stories. So um, um, a nice comment and then one final question. So Meredith um, says, thanks so much to both of you for clearing a way for those behind you. I'm trying to make my way as a lesbian writer and I never would have had the courage to attempt this without your words and others that came before me. Good, good. Keep writing, Meredith. And then the, the final question tonight is um, for both of you, who are you reading now and, um, and that you would recommend to others to read? <laughs> yes, and vice versa. Yeah, please read not only my book, but James Redmond's wonderful work. Um, well, I'm uh, I'm always reading a ton of things, um, but I, a novel that I really liked recently was um, uh, by Brett Bennett. Um, and, uh, oh, you know how it is suddenly, I'm just blanking on the name. Um, yeah. The Vanishing Half? Vanishing Half, the vanishing yes, half? it vanished from my mind. I thought that was a wonderful novel. Um, and I was really gripped by it. She's a great storyteller. I also really like The Some of Us by Heather McGee. Um, I read a lot of anti-racist books this winter, probably like a lot of people, um, but I think that was one of my favorites. It, her images and her breadth of knowledge and her heart um, around the economics of how racism hurts all of us mm -hmm. was really, really powerful. Um, yeah, I am in a translation book group um, here in my little town. Oddly mm -hmm. enough, there are mm -hmm. eight of us who've met for seven years reading a translated book every year. And one of the books that I'm reading now for the, that I chose for August is kind of fascinating. The Feminist Press does a ton of really interesting books. Um, that's someone we should mention because um, they do lesbian authors as well. Um, and they also publish translations 
of lesbian work. And the one that I'm thinking of is called La Bastarda. Um, and it came out this year or last year. And it's from really tiny African country that has the worst human rights record um, on the West Coast, uh, Equatorial Guinea, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's kind of completely blowing my mind. And I would really recommend that too. So that's what I'm reading. Um, well, I, I will confess that I uh, actually last, most of last year, uh, I was actually reading for a prize. Um, you know, I, I was actually one of the Edgar judges. And um, so I just had just, just some, you know, you know that, that uh, uh, scene with Lucy and Ethel at the candy factory. <laughs> Are we old enough to remember that one when the candy line's going too fast and they're suddenly having to start eating and do that sort of stuff to get the candy going? I began to feel like that with all the books, but I will bring out two of them that, that, that particularly stood up to me. One is um, Miracle Submarine by Angie Kim. It won the Pinkley Prize, which is a, a prize for mysteries by, by women. Uh, it is what happens to a, a Korean American family. Um, it is a mystery. Uh, it's also Angie Kim um, is a wonderful person. Um, I met her a couple times. Uh, she I introduced was introduced to her by the fact that she started pouring vodka for everybody on our panel. Um, but she is also a lawyer, so it's it's this very taut um, courtroom drama that also looks at what happens to uh, a Korean immigrant family um, of several generations, and it's 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 quite well done. And the other one is the winner of the Sue Grafton Award for this year. Uh, Veronica Mars isn't dead, and I'm blanking on the author's name. Um, but it was, totally was in the stack. I'm sitting there reading these books, um, and I ran into this one, and I was like, oh, my God, it's a lesbian book um, set in, in the uh, – it's historical, and it would just – it kind of blew me away uh, in terms of mystery. So those are my two that I'll throw out there. Oh, wow. Those are yeah. great. Um, well, those are all wonderful, and I will put those. Um, I'm putting those in the chat. Um, we want to make sure that folks um, buy "Not the Real Juniper" uh, mm -hmm. tonight from Karis. So this teal yes. button is just one click, um, and it'll take you right to the page where you can purchase it from Karis. It really does help us when you buy the event books directly from us. So thank you for considering doing that. The other thing is, um, you know, we. Kara Circle, our nonprofit, is um, how we pay for this event platform and all these other wonderful things that we do. Um, and especially during the pandemic, we rely very much on event donations to help us do this work. So if you are able to make a donation of five or ten dollars, that really does um, help us get to get to reach more folks. So um, the last thing I'll say is it is um, because it's Pride Month, we're participating in something called Give Out Day, which is actually a month long philanthropic. Um, like, I don't even know what to call it, campaign, I guess, for uh, LGBTQ organizations. And you can go to giveoutday.org and choose Kara Circle as your, um, as your chosen spot to give. And one of the cool things about this is it, it really privileges the many over the wealthy. So mm -hmm. our goal is to get as many individual $10 donations as possible. Um, so not like a ton of rich people, but just a ton of people giving $10. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll drop giveoutday.org in the chat. And if you would prefer to give there, as opposed to through this platform, that helps us be eligible for prizes and things like that during, um, this next month. So that is another really wonderful way you can support. Mm -hmm. And if you yes. love carrots, please do share, um, our events online please follow our events online we'll be um doing virtual events throughout the summer at the very least um so, and we we plan to continue to figure out how to do hybrid virtual and in-person events mm -hmm. so that if you're enjoying these events and you don't live in atlanta we want you to be able to continue to enjoy them um and if you've not checked out our youtube channel this event i'll add captions and put it up on our youtube channel mm -hmm. but our youtube channel is just backslash karis circle and our whole archive from, from the last 16 months is up there. And there are a lot of really wonderful um, lesbian fiction events and nonfiction events, poetry, a little bit of everything. So mm -hmm. um, go check it out, um, follow us. And um, I, I do wish that this was physically in the store because um, that would have been really special, but this has been really yeah. wonderful to have you both here um, with us and to have everybody watching at home. So thank you both so much tonight and thank you to Sister Wisdom. 
Um, and uh, I hope that you stay safe and well uh, until we get to, to gather together. Oh, yes. well, thank you, ER and Karis, for hosting this and Sinister Wisdom again. And thanks, JM. It was great to talk with you online. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, ER, Karis, Sinister Wisdom. Support your, even if you buy a card at a bookstore, you know, spend a little bit of money there, <laughs> give them a dollar. Anything you can do helps. It keeps our institutions alive. It keeps our voices out there. Thank you, Barbara. You know, I said it up front. You're an icon. You're somebody who helped me become a writer. You helped many of us become a writer. Um, you're a mother of, of all the lesbian writers. So next, next Mother's Day, we're going to take you out to brunch. <laughs> Thank I you hope all. you can. Yeah. Yes, I'll be there. Yes. We're getting there. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.